Welcome to Horror Makes Us Happy, the podcast where we ask the question, what is it about horror that makes us happy? Your hosts are Steve Becker and myself, Chris Whitman, and you can find out more about us at our website, horrormakesushappy.com. Uh, before we get started, a uh, little information for you and the listeners. These are the trigger warnings. We're going to be talking about horror movies, horror culture, horror literature, um, which could involve anything from murder, rape, suicide, child abuse, all the dark things that may or may not be disturbing. So if that's not something that you're prepared for, please take a moment and uh, maybe come back or don't. But if that's something that you're interested in, Here we sit are. back and listen to us talk about all kinds of fucked up shit and dark things. Uh, let's see. So uh, one more reminder on this, uh, just a slight change in format. We're no longer doing polls. We previously did uh, a poll for who you'd like to see us release a, an episode of uh, the next week, but it just caused too many problems with changing uh, the, the scheduling. So we're going to scrap that and just have a regular old Scheduled release releases. Schedule. Yes. Scheduled even. <laughs> yes. Uh, speaking of which, speaking next of week's schedule. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. Next week guest, next week's guest, words, is uh, producer, writer, and director Adrian Garcia Bogliano, known for Late Phases. Very interesting little werewolf flick. That's that didn't do it justice. It's an awesome film. I love it. And <laughs> excited to talk to him. Uh, if you're new here, welcome to Horror Makes Us Happy. We talk about fucked up shit with fucked up people, <laughs> and uh, we also have some side projects as well. Um, I have a uh, pieces project, which I have huge pipe dreams of ultimately making into a full length feature film and before that a uh, indie film. Currently, it's a web comic at pieces of and I'm doing multiple chapter prequels of some of the characters. So if you want to check that out, awesome. Feel free. Check it on out. Uh, Steve has a self-help book called um, a guide to the recovery toolbox. Thank you. I've said that a million times. And of course, now that I'm on the spot, I'm like, yeah, blank <laughs> <laughs> a guide to the recovery toolbox. It's a very good book. The goal of which is to uh, help people be more efficient in their own recovery, but also have a better and more meaningful conversation uh, about things that With they people need to in talk general. About. Yeah. Yeah. But today's guest. Oh, actually we, well, no, we did. Uh, we mentioned Adrian. Yes. Today's guest. Yes. <laughs> Today's guest is Jeff Burke, author and B-R-K. yes, yes, B R B U R K, not B U R K E. This is very important. <laughs> That's me. Yes, <laughs> author and editor of uh, Bizarro and Horror magazine and several novels. Uh, what, what were the the series of novels, Jeff? Oh well, I have a uh, I have three novels. I wrote Shatner Quake. Shatner Quest mm -hmm. and Super Giant Monster Time. And I also have mm -hmm. two short story collections by the names of Cripple Wolf and The Very Ineffective Haunted House. <laughs> Those all sound awesome. I'm curious, is, is Cripple Wolf what it sounds like? Like, is, is it a wolf it's, where the person broke their leg? So when they transform, they also have a broken leg? Well, it's about a wheelchair bound werewolf that's loose on an airplane that caters to fetish sex enthusiasts. But that that's wow. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea came about that I was hanging out with here, a little name dropping. I was hanging out with a uh, People or anyone listening as Bizarro fans can be like, I know those people. I was hanging out with uh, Carl Tamelik the Third and Cameron Pierce, and I was like, uh, I had recently gotten in my head the idea of a werewolf on an airplane. I'm like, oh man, being trapped with a werewolf on an airplane sounds so fucking cool. I love this, but how does everyone not just die in the first five minutes? Our mm -hmm. solution: the werewolf is in a wheelchair. So you had to. Um God, I'm going to hate myself for this, but you, you had to give the werewolf a handicap, huh? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Terrible I've actually joke. gotten Terrible. really <laughs> interesting responses to that book from people um, who are actually, like, uh, like different, uh, differently abled and that you mm -hmm. never see a character in a wheelchair be a badass villain tearing the shit out of everybody. That's just something you never, sure. never see. So I've gotten a really, yeah, I've gotten really positive feedback actually from those communities over m doing a story about, you know, this villain that is in a wheelchair, but is literally tearing all the other characters apart limb from limb. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. Yeah, that could be empowering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 
for the record, I'm sorry for, you know, giggling at my own uh, joke at, at first, because that's just a terrible habit. But also the uh, comment I made about giving the werewolf a handicap, it was, I was not laughing at the handicap or the disablement. I was laughing at the pun of your pun, like, yes. like a golf handicap, you know, yes. gotta, we got you. We got you. <laughs> just saying, I like puns, not <laughs> bad humor. Well, I don't know about that. I, 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 <laughs> well, I, you know, I think puns. <laughs> I think bad, like, puns overly are offensive, bad like crossing humor. the line. They they are. That's the fun bad humor. Uh. <laughs> anyway, in this interview, <laughs> we'll be asking three sets of questions covering your childhood, teenage years, and adulthood to find out what it is that you like about horror to kind of you know get at the root of what inspired you to get into horror in the first place. Uh, the idea is that we. In, interview enough people we might find some interesting and common themes we kind of have already there's been some common threads here and there and some crazy off the wall ones but um yeah that being said this isn't meant to be any kind of therapy session so if at any time we ask any question you don't want to answer you can just say pass and understood and we'll keep asking it because <laughs> that won't work <laughs> just to make sure you really mean it yeah. All right. All right. I I listened to I I see I came prepared. Unlike so many other people on so many different podcasts, yeah. I actually was listening to your show in preparation for this. So I believe there I know. There is no preparation for. I this. believe I know what I'm getting myself in for. Yeah, <laughs> no, that is that is appreciated. So starting with childhood. Yeah. What are some uh, earliest memories that you can think of of things that either scared you or inspired you that were horror like? Well, uh. In terms of like my earliest memories regarding the horror genre, it's actually really hard for me um, because it was always kind of present around me. Both of my parents were horror fans. Um, mm. My dad's favorite movie was uh, um, Hellraiser, and nice. my mom's favorite movie is the original Hills Have Eyes. And nice. when I say about like from the very beginning, horror being around, this is no joke at all. I literally learned to read. One of the things my parents used to help teach me to read was cheap reprints of EC comics, you know, like Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, Haunt of Fear. <laughs> like that's one of the ways I learned to read. And my parents, it was, it was actually something I didn't realize until I was well into adulthood. Uh, they kind of really heavily discouraged me from uh, children's media that they hmm. like, I didn't really grow up watching like children's shows or children's movies. Like there's, there's shit tons of really mega popular, like kids movies that everyone that was a kid has seen. And I never saw. And it wasn't, that I wasn't like allowed to watch them, but if I showed like interest in a children's movie or like a 1950 sci-fi film, my parents pushed me to the 1950 sci-fi film or okay. like, I, I just have to quickly ask two, two questions. Yes. Secret of Nim? Never mm. seen it. Ah. Ah. Dark Crystal. Yeah. I saw that when I was an adult. Okay. All right, we can continue the call. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, horror was kind of always just around. And it was also mm -hmm. kind of, like, really introduced in a... I, I want to say a kind of like measured way that like growing up, my parents, like, like people would be like, Oh, when was the first R rated movie you watched? I have absolutely no <laughs> clue when my first <laughs> R rated movie was that my parents kind of watch, let me watch whatever, but hmm? they would occasionally say, no, you're too young for this. You won't understand it. And the, like the movie that really stands out in my mind was, I remember um, when I first kind of heard about a clockwork orange oh, and <laughs> that was one that they said of like, no, you can't, yeah. you can't watch that till you're older because you won't understand it. And so I ended up seeing a clockwork orange as a teenager and I'm like, Oh yeah, I understand why you don't want like a 10 year old watching a clockwork orange because oh, I, no, I would no, not well, cause, cause 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 I would just not, drink a little bit of milk with LSD in it and the guy smashes a lady's face in with a penis sculpture what's wrong with that but I wouldn't have <laughs> but I wouldn't have understood it like like the, the whole context is context is yeah. of like the sexual violence and things like that mm -hmm. it, you know it, I would not have understood it. and so I was actually never really a rebellious kid at all <laughs> in terms of like media now 
<laughs> no, it's talking about like what's the earliest memory of like something scaring you, like related to the horror genre. I do have that. Um, okay. okay. When I was, oh, I don't know how young I was. I was very young. So I want to guess somewhere around like five, six, somewhere in there. I saw the last half of Gremlins on TV. Now, okay. I don't know how or why this happened, but I remember this. Uh, I somehow only saw the last half of the movie, and it fucking traumatized me. I had nightmares <laughs> for months. You know, everyone laughs about this. Everyone laughs. But then when I was a teenager, I finally went back to Gremlins. I'm like, oh, my God, I remember this when I was little. Like, this was so terrifying. And then I mm -hmm. watched it. And it turns out it's a goddamn comedy. I had no <laughs> idea. And if you just watch like the second half of the movie, if you go back and look at just that second half, when you've removed the kind of like the context, context. of the yeah. first half, like it's like to a tiny little kid, like it's traumatizing. Like I didn't see cute cuddly gizmo. I only saw these lizard Monsters. humanoid things running around and terrorizing people in the snow. I don't, I don't want to speak for Chris, but I know what I was laughing at is that you're talking about having all this introduction to horror and then it's gremlins that scare yes, you. I know, I know. Isn't that, isn't that so ironic? For some reason, just that out of context, seeing those monsters yeah. running around, just it's a little mind traumatized me. Now I want to say gremlins. I adore gremlins. I like, uh, my, my girlfriend and I, we watch it practically every Christmas now. It's like, like yeah. Christmas gremlins is wonderful. It's a right. Christmas movie. It's a Christmas movie. It's a great yeah. Christmas movie because you know Santa Claus dies in the in the chimney. Like that's, <laughs> that, that's that makes awesome. it a great Christmas movie. <laughs> I hate Santa Claus. I hate a lot of things with Christmas. So Gremlins is kind of my jam. Got it. No, what you said about um, you know, isn't it funny or strange or odd? I don't remember the word you used, but you know, this out of context thing. Yeah. Uh, it, but that act that actually makes a lot of sense because quite often. I don't know. I know there's at least one or two other guests, I think, that have mentioned something like that, but not even among our guests. But I think it generally known <clears throat> the things that can be traumatic to kids often are things that are taken out of context mm -hmm. because they don't have that context. Then it they're freaked out because they, they don't know what what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And directly related to that. Like, I, I don't have those negative memory. Like, I. Well, my memory of Gremlins is not negative, but I did not have that negative reaction to the things like the comic, the tales, like the comic books I mentioned, reading at an earlier, like like around the same age or whenever, and like the other movies I I watched my parents or my parents let me watch, and they all had context to them, so yeah. it was just these like introduced with this this chaotic thing with no rhyme or reason behind it. As far as I knew was just something that really, really upset me at that early age. Mm -hmm. So what trying to remember what you said, uh, it was about gremlins that scared you. I'm, I mean, thinking about the movie in general, if you didn't have that first half of it, I mean, the monsters are, well, chaotic is, is probably the best word for it. That the movie is chaotic. It, it was. It was that. It was that chaos. It was that yeah. n uh, no context chaos. And you know what? That's actually a thing that still bothers me to this day. I almost feel like I'm going to be jumping ahead in the questions here. Um, but like. When, so, like, I love, love a Serbian film. I love Campbell Holocaust. I love Necromantic. I love writers like Jack Ketchum and Edward Lee. Um, I, like, I'm really into the, like, you know, the vile, disgusting, mean-spirited shit. I mean, but, like, what actually, to the, when people are like, well, what, like, do any of those movies bother you? Or does any of those books bother you? And I'm like, no, they don't. But what I always get hung up on, and this sounds so silly, but it really is to this day the thing that actually does bother me is you've all seen like the Michael Bay Transformer movies, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've seen one of them. I don't know which one I saw, but I saw one of them. And I always bring this up just because I find it the perfect example. That there's some mm -hmm. scene where there's like these two giant robots and they're fighting and then they spill over onto a freeway. And they keep fighting mm -hmm. on the freeway. And while they're fighting, all these cars are crashing. And where my mm -hmm. mind immediately goes to 
is that person that's in their car, you know, driving home from work, living their fucking life, and then just suddenly chaos happens and they're dead. That's it. They have no mm-hmm. context to what happened. Their death has no rhyme or reason. And of course, that's never remotely addressed in any of those action movies or that. But that's actually the thing that does get under my skin. That I can do Campbell Holocaust, no fucking problem. But the PG-13 action movie is actually the thing that gets me like mm-hmm. my brain working of like, oh, that's awful. That's an awful way yeah. to go. Reminds me of the, uh, it's, it's actually from Star Trek, but you know, the line, I think it's from Jean-Luc that says, uh, you can do everything right and still lose. Yeah. yeah. I love Star Trek. <laughs> Hells yeah. <laughs> I've got a Star Trek tattoo. I- I'm into all sorts of genre stuff. Like, like horror, horror is my main thing, but I'm also a big lover of science fiction. I'm not really a fan of fantasy. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. To each their own. Their own. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, so anything else other than gremlins that you remember scaring you in your childhood? Oh, scare me in my childhood. Oh, um, the gremlins, that was really, that was really the big one that traumatized me for a long time. Mm. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Um, and, and this was when I can think of one that scared the shit out of me, but this made me like really addictive to being scared. When I was probably around, uh, 11 or 12 years old, I first saw Alien. Uh, that scared okay. the shit out of me. No, no, it wasn't. No, it was earlier than that. I was around eight. It was between like eight and ten. I first saw Alien. And I literally did the thing of I was so scared that I left the room, but I was so invested in, into the movie that I was like peering around the doorway to watch the movie. <laughs> in particular, it was the scene when uh, uh, Bishop the Android uh, turns and is um, trying to kill Ripley by rolling up that porno mag and shoving it down her throat. And then he starts, mm. it was when he started bleeding milk and that just freaked me the fuck out. I was like, what the hell is happening in this movie? I have no idea what's going on. And yeah. I was scared, but I was so in infatuated and so i couldn't look away but like i I literally did like the like the kid thing of like hiding but peering out and then that was that movie is also notable because then in the uh, last scene sigourney weaver and those tiny panties uh (laughs) definitely was sending off some like signals in my early kid brain that i also didn't (laughs) fully understand yet can relate can relate (laughs) i think uh yeah that moment in alien for me was one of the first moments where it was just like Oh, now I see what all the fuss is about. Yeah, it's like, oh, I, it's like, oh I'm also interested in this, but I'm not entirely sure why yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, remind me, the bleeding milk thing did, I can't remember, at that point in the movie, we knew he was an android, though, right? No, that's yeah. the reveal that he's the android. Oh, wait, yeah, that's right. That's the yeah, reveal. It was, it was you not do not know then. he's an android yet. And so okay. when you don't know that, and then she's fighting back, and I, I forget exactly what causes his quote unquote skin to rupture. Um, right. But when she that happens, hits him or something, but yeah, there's like a tight starts, close up on his eye and you see like a small drip come down from his forehead. That's it. That's it. It's, it yes. And then he starts bleeding milk and that's, and you as a viewer first time seeing the movie, it's like, wait, what's happening? What is going on? And then uh-huh. it progresses into the reveal that he's actually an Android. But and then doesn't he like that, spaz out and start making mechanical whirling noises as he he's flailing his vom- arms? He around? starts like vomiting yeah. the milk out. <laughs> like that freaked the hell out of me. But that was also the time I remember of getting like addicted to that sensation of okay, being yeah. like, oh, this is crazy. This is ca- this is art causing an emotional reaction in me. And that's, I love it. That's impressive. At the age of eight, you were uh mature and intellectual enough to you know realize that um lost my damn train of thought here <laughs> steve that holy shit this is amazing <laughs> that <laughs> well i mean like i i was always presented with the stuff that this isn't real like i sometimes mm-hmm. find it very surprising how deeply upsetting some people can find uh horror art in any medium because Mm -hmm. it's not real like and that's one of the things i kind of like love about it it's a really safe way to explore and indulge in 
some of the very negative aspects of the world. I, I don't view it that much different than, you know, going on roller coasters, which yeah. you know, what are theme parks other than like simulated near, near death experiences and mm-hmm. the horror genre as an art form in whatever medium offers similar uh, thrills of getting that look at the dark and forbidden side of, of humanity. So going back to something you said earlier that you said you find it surprising that people get upset with horror. Like they can't understand that it's real, but I thought there was an interesting, it's interesting that you said that because even using your own example with gremlins, it's when you can't tell something's not real that of course it's scary because you can't tell it's real or you keep sorry that you can't tell it's not real. And the fact that you can't tell that it's not real, then you identify with it more strongly it's kind of like the whole body horror thing. You know, the reason that a lot of people get grossed out by a body horror is particularly because they think about it happening to their own body and they can't make that separation. You know what I mean? Oh, I do know what you mean, but I do view it as a gigantic difference between my young, like five, six year old brain and what should be a fully functioning adult. Um, Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to like it. If people don't like gross movies, they don't like gross movies. That's totally cool. Like, um, I was listening to, like, some previous episodes of the show, and then one of them uh, got brought up about that there was some discussion about whether or not including the content warning in the beginning of the show. I think content warnings are great. Um, That way, the people that uh, don't want to deal with these subjects, with this topic matter, with these ideas, don't have to. I totally get it. Like, I have some friends that uh, through, you know, like, uh, really bad things have happened in their life. They can't uh, enjoy certain entertainment. That it, well, it's preparing, it, the, it's preparing the context. It's, what, get, what gets me is the people that um, put moralistic values on enjoying such entertainment of, well, if you like a movie that features lots of graphic uh, sexual violence in it, therefore you must endorse sexual violence. It's like, no, no, not all. Like it it horrifies me. Name of the genre horror. That's something that Mm -hmm. actually can be bothersome actually that can get under the skin. Cause I hate to break it to everyone, but vampires ain't real. Haunted houses, they ain't real. Aliens, at least in terms of type to come to Earth and flying saucers and abduct us, most likely ain't real. Um, But rapists are real. Uh, War crimes are real. All. um, Well, here, okay. So, I mean, I could say people might have an argument in the terms of, you know, I've heard people say it has to make sense in the story. However. I think that entire conversation is diverting from the theme of our call. <laughs> True. Um, so going back to your childhood. Yes. You mentioned uh, Gremlins, Alien. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about some other stuff. You did mention that your parents were uh, horror fans. Did you have any, any other friends or family members who were fans of horror? Oh. At that age? No. No, I really didn't. I really didn't. Um my, my mom and dad, it was really just my, my uh, mom and dad, uh, they divorced when I was an infant. So they had like shared mm-hmm. custody of me growing up and mm-hmm. um, they were both big horror fans and they introduced me and nurtured that. Um, I also, my, uh, my mom who had main custody of me lived with her parents. So I grew up with my grandparents. They did not care for any of the horror stuff <laughs> at all they did not like it and then like for friends um i mean like when i was in you know the early school years and like high school and up through college it was uh, an epiphany i had as adult is there's like this uh cliche this character type of person you knew from your youth that was always a uh, the kid that was showing you the really weird shit and it was like mm-hmm. oh fuck i was that kid the, I was the one forcing all my friends like, oh, you haven't seen this yet? You gotta see this. No, no. When I was a little kid, um, I was super into it. And I'm still into this day. In fact, I have a tattoo of it. I'm a gigantic Godzilla fan. 
And like when okay. I was a real little kid, I was introducing all my other little kid friends. Of, like, have you seen Godzilla? And like none of them had because. Like <laughs> I, I grew up in very small town Pennsylvania, so, so like I was the only one watching like Japanese B movies as a child. <laughs> it's like so now looking back on it, I was like, wow, that's weird, but it's awesome. That, like <laughs> it is, yeah, it's it's weird and awesome. It's both. And so I was yeah. the one showing all the other kids, like you guys, like and this King Ghidorah is a three headed golden dragon and Mothra. It's a giant moth, but you know. That sounds lame, but he's not lame. Mother's awesome. She's awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think uh, I think Godzilla and the other monsters in that show they're very similar to uh, what was that? I think uh, Eric Savino was talking about He Man. That um, I never watched He Man. You know, yeah, see, that's like another example of like kids stuff. I just didn't. I just didn't see. Well, mm-hmm. but the thing that they have in common uh, that he kind of referenced was that there's a, an element of power uh, that's entertaining to kids, particularly because kids often are powerless respectively to, you know, older kids and yeah. uh, adults and things like that. So I, I've heard that idea uh, put forward over like that uh, Godzilla stuff is like notoriously very appealing to children. I've heard that idea put forward be- of that. Here's these creatures that have such power and control over the world and you know when you're a small child you have power and control over nothing and then you get right. older and you realize how little power and control you have over anything and it becomes much more existential terror than it does being <laughs> frustrated over a bedtime yeah mm. yeah that's a common thread i've seen <laughs> so did you experience anything in your childhood that did introduce uh, any existing or you know like permanent fears oh permanent fears um not really. Um, like, you know, I was thinking about this earlier. I was trying to think of like, like probably what's the like most like traumatic and upsetting thing that happened to me while I was a little kid. And um, I mean, this is true. I almost drowned in my own blood. Ooh, whoa! I had uh, my tonsils taken out uh, at a very early age, mm-hmm. and um, after I had my tonsils taken out, about a week or two into the healing process. I woke up one morning and I felt super nauseous, just felt like so sick. And I rushed to the bathroom and I threw up blood, just pure blood. And I then kept throwing up blood. And then the blood clots came. I had these massive blood clots of like the size of softballs that were getting stuck in my mouth that they were so large. I couldn't, I I remember having to, pry out with my fingers these massive blood clots out of my mouth so what happened was uh the scab in the back of my throat from the tonsil surgery had come off early and so i had been bleeding bleeding down your bleeding down and i had um i've been going straight into my stomach for maybe a day or two so my stomach was literally filled with blood and um my uh this my grandparent this is when i lived with my grandparents and um they called 911, of course, of small child throwing up blood. And fortunately, uh, I wasn't too far away from a major hospital because the audience, the ambulance had me sitting at like a 45 degree, 45 degree mm-hmm. angle. Well, that, yeah. that angle they had me at had rerouted the blood from my open wound. Instead of flowing into my stomach, it was flowing into my lungs. So if the Ooh. ambulance ride had been longer, I would have literally have drowned in my own blood to, on the way to the hospital. And, you know, it didn't leave me with any fears at all from it. If anything, it probably <laughs> left me with like kind of a fascination over, you know, that goriness. Mm. Well, I'm glad that it didn't affect you negatively. That's because that's serious shit. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. But it gives me the great fucking story. All right. Yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> I uh, I had some something similar happened uh, when I was a kid that, like you say, it didn't affect me that badly. But uh, it's because it had to, you know, turned out well at the end. Yeah, like I, I've listened to other episodes on here, and like there's like parent stuff frequently comes up, and I'm like, I'm f- I, I guess I'm quote unquote fortunate that my parents who hated each other divorced when I was an infant, so I kind of missed that whole thing. I just kind of grew up with. Like, you know, normal family not being even the thing I had context for. 
regardless of the divorce, it sounds like your parents both, uh, you know, you said that they both had custody of you and had some sort of, you know, input on your rearing. And I think that's the bigger, uh, issue than the divorce itself. For example, like for my, in my case, my parents divorced when I was two and a half and I went to live with my dad on a different part of the country. And I almost never saw my mother, you know, that's, that's more impacting than the divorce part of it. It was, you know, it's the relationships that are meaningful. Well, re- related to that, I did become, I guess this is moving a little bit forward in the, in the time frame here, but like in the teenage years, I did become um, estranged from my father when I was uh, 16, because mm-hmm. around then is when he found Christ. Uh, and suddenly mm-hmm. then all these things, which he had helped introduce me to, then became evil and satanic and mm. it turned him into a much more negative person. And then, uh, my mom got full custody of me when I was 16 and I hadn't had any interactions with him until in fact, early last year, I, uh, I got reached out to him on Facebook of all things. And then one month later, um, he had a random heart attack and died. Ooh. Well, I mean, the fact that you maybe had a somewhat decent relationship for the first 16 years, I mean, those are the formative years. Oh, yes, I did. I very much did. For those first 16 years, uh, like, you know, I had complaints, but a lot of complaints were, you know, your normal angsty childhood complaints. Right. Right. So let's quickly go through some of the other uh, questions that we normally ask for childhood. Did did you have any reoccurring scary dreams? Uh, About gremlins, yes. (laughs) <laughs> okay any other nope nope just gremlins <laughs> All right. uh did you participate in halloween as a child yes yes oh yeah the halloween questions yeah um <laughs> um i loved halloween as a kid it was and okay. it still is my favorite holiday um okay. uh i i am i'm gonna get ahead of you here uh, and asking the questions i don't really remember any costumes it wasn't the costumes okay. thing that really got me with halloween what I what liked, like about it? I liked was the Halloween parties and every place showing horror movies and the Halloween specials. Um, for some reason, I've never really been a costume person. I'm still not to this day. I like almost never dress up for a Halloween. Like I've maybe wore a costume once in the past 15 years for a Halloween. Okay, wow. It's just not my thing. I, what I really like go- doing is going out and seeing other people's costumes. Like hmm. it's other okay. people's like dressing up about like, I find it so cool. I love it. I love. And like when I was a kid, um, I remember that my school friends who I couldn't even tell you what their names are right now, but who, you know, whoever you were friends with when you were like 10, 11, 12 years old. And I was in small town, Pennsylvania. And that was the night that our parents let us run around super late into the night, which is probably like nine, 10 o'clock. But to us, that was right. like, you know, late for young kids. Oh my God, we're out this late and it's, it's been dark and we're running around and they're giving us candy. And <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. And then, you know, go back. And I remember watching, um, I don't really think it's really a thing anymore, but I, I remember this so clearly as a kid of, um, all of the like the dumb sitcoms and dumb TV shows doing Halloween specials, and mm-hmm, right. and of course there was the Simpsons Halloween specials, which I remember very clearly. Uh, mm-hmm. My my dad in particular was a huge um, Simpsons fan, and I still watch uh, Simpsons Halloween specials every year to this day. I have not missed a single year. Um, really? I, I love I love Halloween, and then. I actually only think I grew to love it more as I got older. Um, is this uh, interrupting the line of questions? If I'm like talk about like older Halloween stuff. Good. Oh yeah. Then, sure. um, then when I got older, um, so like in my teenage years, when I was like in high school, I would organize my friends and I, we do all night horror movie marathons. Uh, awesome. Uh, on Halloween every single year. And we'd always like, pick a bunch of movies we never saw before and uh you know do them i saw so many 
movies. Like I remember, uh, that's how I first saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of those nights. I remember. Um, and then when I was in college and this is what, this is where shit got crazy. So when I was in college, I would organize, I I had two different types of Halloween parties. I did, I did, uh, massive Halloween costume parties, which the one I threw was like, no joke. Some shit you'd seen out of a, uh, like college comedy movie that I had this (laughs) house that myself and some friends rented, and we threw a big Halloween costume party bash. And I probably had around three to 500 people in and out of my house that night. And wow. it was awesome. Then my other favorite Halloween party I ever threw, it was Halloween night. And to, I only invited close friends. I ended up being around, it was, ended up being around maybe 15 to 20 people. And the okay. rule for getting in is you had to take a hallucinogen. I had ah. the choice of shrooms, uh, LSD, or 2CB, which anyone not familiar with that, it's kind of a synthetic uh, hallucinogen. Uh, oh, well, I know. Synthetic, I mean, it's, it's made in a, it's made chemically. And well, I mean, LSD is, you all know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and It's made with more chemicals. I had been, uh, I, I was, uh, part of several event co- official event committees with the school, so I had access to some sco- special school equipment, and I got a projector and a projector nice. screen. And I was going to ask if you did that. And then what I had found was a six-hour-long fundamentalist Christian documentary on oh, on alternative underground music now you know how like christians get upset <laughs> over like or uh, this is back in the uh, 90s early 2000s oh, get yeah, upset over things like magic the gathering and harry potter and mm-hmm. um the you know devil's yeah. game yes and it's like if only they knew about the really underground stuff out there this was a six hour long Christian documentary about that underground stuff. So, and you decided to project this onto a screen yes. at a large or at a, at a party. Yes. And with, with hallucinogens. That's, yes. That sounds like an interesting evening. Oh, everyone that attended it still, <laughs> still remembers it to this day as being an amazing night. We had so much fun because it was so cool that it, like, it was like live concert footage of like throbbing gristle and then cutting to a, a Christian preacher explaining throbbing gristle. Do, do, do you know who <laughs> throbbing gristle? When the uh, founder, like those, this was a band that literally termed industrial in terms of music it comes from this band throbbing gristle whose first album was called industrial music for industrial people that was one of the greatest nights of my life not bad bad. so let's jump back to childhood (laughs) real quick (laughs) having gone through that uh, long long journey well i mean then we just won't ask those questions yeah yeah we covered halloween through all the generations we're good there (laughs) yeah that's right (laughs) So to jump back, um, you know, you mentioned gremlins and alien kind of scaring you. Yeah. Um, but the other horror themed stuff, uh, you know, you, by default, I'm guessing then it didn't scare you. So how did you feel about those other things? Oh, the other things. I, I mean, I just found it fun. Was it just like normal, like, like bland to you or were you attracted to it for other reasons? I mean, I wouldn't say it was bland. I mean, I was attracted to it. I always was like as long back as I can remember, like attracted to uh, uh, fantasy, not in terms of the genre, but in terms of like the, like the more traditional meaning of the word over the imagination. I, I just always like dug that stuff. And I thought okay. I, I, I would not, I would never have vocalized it at the time, but with age, I can look back on it that I always loved the human imagination over show me something i've never seen before your shit has whatever that is going on my shit has monsters i always love monsters i always just love monsters what do you love about monsters oh they're so it's so different it's visually interesting like uh like uh obviously this is a podcast so people can't see me but as of right now i currently have a bright purple 
mohawk. I have uh, facial piercings. I have visible tattoo, visible tattoos on my body. Um, I like things being visually interesting, and uh, like you know, monsters they look different, and that was something always very attractive to me over just being visually different. Something I didn't see every day. Is there something about looking different in itself that is attractive to you? As in like presenting myself in such a way? Uh, not just you personally, but like, like, for example, you mentioned you loved Halloween because you're seeing these kids dressed up. Yeah. I'm, you know, is there something about the act of looking different that is meaningful to you for some reason? I just get and have always gotten just bored with day in, day out normalcy. Like, it just is boring to me. And, like, you know, tying into the Halloween of, like, it's one day a year when people kind of, let, you know, let their freak flag fly. Mm-hmm. And you just don't see that often. You don't see that signs of things. And I get bored very easy. I, I have been diagnosed with a, a rather strong... Um, um, Squirrel. Uh, adult ADHD, which I'm ADHD. sure everyone listening to this has already gathered and figured out by now. <laughs> um, but I think I, about every, everyone over the age of, I uh, would say, 30 or 35 has some degree of ADD at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got diagnosed with it when I was very young. I got di- diagnosed with it when I was very young, and it never really went away. I just kind of like, you know, learned to adjust to it. It's just how my brain works. And so I get bored really easy. And so, yeah. you know, seeing things of, you know, fantasy and horror and science fiction, it's something different. And I am, I've always been kind of desperate just for something different. Stimuli. Yes. Hmm. Yes. It's interesting that you say that because it, before we got to that, what I was actually thinking about is how different uh, ADHD and sometimes autism spectrum can, uh, I want to be careful how I say this cause it can piss a lot of people off, but they're different ends of the spectrum in terms, in terms of, uh, oh. uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Wait, wait, give me a second. Um, uh, sensory input. Yeah, like I, there's, I know if autists you're... can often get overwhelmed by sensory yes. input and eight people who are on the ADHD, ADHD spectrum often revel in it. Like do, yeah, crave they, it. They hunger for more of it. You're right. Yeah. That's an interesting yeah. you know, observation. I've never there. made that connection before, but I believe you're completely correct. I, I, I've, I've known people throughout my life that um, have been on uh, some different levels of the autism spectrum. And, uh, See, now I'm, I'm trying to make sure I phrase it correctly. Uh, so please forgive anyone listening if I uh, use an uh, incorrect term. I truly do not mean to. But um, having a, a routine is normally something that is very beneficial for people that have those um, that different way of neurological thinking. Whereas for me, a routine is like mind-numbing. I hate it. I, I, I can't stand it. My brain functions less under those things. Right. So I'm starting to wonder how much the ADHD part of it plays into your love of horror then. Um, Cause I could see those two dovetailing very well. <laughs> yeah. I mean like horror frequently in almost any medium is you normally start out with um, some sense of normalcy, some aspect of the normal world and then, chaos is introduced frequently violently in such right. garish over the top ways. Um, yeah. And that's, I made the joke earlier about squirrel. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's, 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 that's the cut. That's, that's me. That's, that's the, the trope for ADHD. It's, you know, that, that is the, like, so, so said, those two dovetail very, very nicely. Mm-hmm. I, 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 you know what? I never made that connection before, but that's a really intriguing point. Well, that might be the thing for you. Let's so let's go through the uh, the other sections of the interview and see. You know, does this hold up, or maybe something else will crop up that is maybe more fitting for you? All right. Um, so moving into teenage years, yes. what were some of the scary stories or books or movies during your teenage years? Well, during my teenage years, um, I kind of feel like we kind of like. Uh, uh, well, hmm. Oh, oh! I know, I know, I know. Oh man, I can't believe I almost forgot. I almost forgot a huge one. 
I know exactly. So hmm. I am from uh, South Central Pennsylvania. So we were three miles from the Pennsylvania Maryland state line state line in the middle of fucking nowhere and nearby right on the other side of it in maryland a little movie by the name of the blair witch project was filmed oh. and huh. so uh it's i saw blair witch project at a local theater bef- like r- before it blew up and it scared the shit out of me it was one of those <laughs> times and like we lived in the woods, so I went from the movie theater to my uh, house that was literally in the woods, and I had a hard time going to sleep that <laughs> night, that night. Let me tell you, and I remember being so scared in the theater watching that movie, and also being like, I lo- thinking like to myself at the time, like I love this, I love this, I love this. I want to be involved with this when I grow up. I want to make other people feel this way. I love this. I love this. That was a big one. That was a big one. Okay. Cool. And um. Oh shit. And then there was uh. Fuck. There was another thing that. Oh. Oh. I knew what I was gonna say. I know. I was the other thing I was gonna say. So I went to my first horror convention ever. And uh, do you remember in the times before the internet at conventions when you'd have the VHS bootlegger tables? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And the bootleg stand was buy two, get the third free. And mm. I didn't really know about what any of these movies, what, what a lot of the movies were. So I asked the person, um, what is the movie you'd recommend? And he's like, have you seen Ringu? And I'm like, I've never even heard of it. It's like, oh, just trust me. Take this. I got a, this is no joke whatsoever, a blank VHS of ring, a bootleg of Ringu. And that night, um, and if anyone's maybe a little unclear, Ringu is the original Japanese name of The Ring. Ah. And I went home that night and put a blank VHS into the VCR, no <laughs> clue what this movie was, and watched mm-hmm. the original Japanese The Ring for the first time. That's Holy an interesting fuck, film to watch on a bootleg VHS. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't think there's a more ideal way to ever see the original The Ring than yeah. that scenario that I had. Of, a, of course. Just a unmarked VHS tape putting that in and the whole thing of being the haunted vhs tape oh it was so perfect oh wait so you were perfect. in the woods so did you by any chance have a well that out back yes yes we did <laughs> no i'm not joking perfect. we had well water <laughs> was it like a classic like circular stone well too no no not like that unfortunately yeah. or else i would have made it that would have been too perfect <laughs> just have trouble crawling up the pipe <laughs> yes yes it was it was all pipes <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh blair witch project uh the ring yeah Anything else jump out at you oh um to switch medium a little bit always been a huge comic book guys i've already already mm-hmm. mentioned i learned to read with comic books Right. And um, it was when I was in, a teenager, I was a gigantic fan of the comic book series Preacher, which, ah, okay. nice. and I actually remember this. I actually came aboard on issue roughly 25. So it would have been two, 97. I would have been around 13. Oh, yeah. So those hormones are really kicking in at 13. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so like like this comic that has like over the top violence, but then it also has over the top sex. And I'm like, oh, I like this combination. <laughs> and uh, that's something that really, really stuck with, with me to this very day of of what I love. And it also was, it, it was like thrilling. It was exciting. It was smart. It didn't talk down to you. And it was very adult level entertainment. And that was probably the first time that on my own, I, I don't remember how I found out about Preacher. I probably found out about through um, Wizard Magazine. I was super into Wizard Magazine. Ah, Wizard Magazine. I mean, yes. it was a Vertigo title. So, I mean, most of the Vertigo stuff was pretty good like that. I was going to ask you if you also read Sandman around the same time. Um, No, I did not read Sandman until later. And I'm not really that big of a fan of Sandman. I, I'm not that big of a fan of Neil Gaiman. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Plus, it's on the I'm side of fantasy. fantasy so you, yeah, you yeah. mentioned earlier, you're not a fantasy fan. Yeah, I, I'm more of a like like preacher was my introduction into the whole Vertigo world, and this is off of horror. But then I got into super into Transmetropolitan and the Invisibles and um, uh, Alan Moore's stuff like Swamp Thing. Um, oh, Swamp mm-hmm. Thing is horror, but that was all kind of later. Yeah. It was Preacher that was my introduction into that kind of world of adult comic books. And mm. that was the one that it, it really left a major impact on me. I already mentioned that, like, you know, my parents helped teach me to read with comic books, which I'm surprised more people don't, don't do because, you know, you got the words and you got the pictures and they kind right. of flow into That's each how other. How to read no my, shit, my you cousin. Defer- really? Yeah. yeah. My cousins, uh, well, my aunt and uncle sold their house and bought a boat and sailed around the Caribbean. And my cousins left their comic book collection at my grandmother's house. And then she raised me. So they were in the basement. So I grew up reading 60s and 70s comic books. As, when you brought up comics, I was going to ask if, since you like horror, did, would, were you familiar with The Witching Hour? Oh, I know The Witching Hour. Yes, I indeed I do. Yes. I had a couple copies of that. That's Thanks awesome. That. That's amazing. <laughs> You're literally the first other person I've then have met that, like, ties learning to read with comic books and i'm so shocked mm-hmm. that's not more of a standard thing it just makes sense to me you know i think it probably was more common you know 60s 70s maybe even 80s but uh i don't know how how common it would be now because i don't i mean obviously for people who are fans of comic books their kids might be more inclined to do that but uh i remember when i was a kid like my father would take me on road trips to visit family members around the country. And we would stop at, uh, you know, the gas station, uh, you know, truck stop, rest stop. And they would have a rack that would rotate with oh, shit, yeah. bags I, of comics. For I miss that. Three for two bucks. I miss that so much. I miss that so much. Yeah. And I haven't seen one of those in decades. Oh but, God. It's you know. been so long. It's been so long since I've seen that. The other thing that's not strictly horror related, but there was a touch of it in one in some of the sub the the the, the side um, issue not issues but uh, series I guess you could say. I'm curious. Did you check out Grendel at all? I'm I'm sorry. Uh, there was a quick skip there. Did I check out what? Grendel. Oh, Grendel. Oh, um, f- fuck. No, I never did. Who did that? I know, I know, I've, uh, I've, I've come across that title, but I've the never... artist was Matt War, Matt Warner, or Wagner, yes, sorry, yes, yes, yes. Um, no, I, I am not. I have never, I have never read it. I have definitely seen that title cr- come across my radar at numerous times throughout my life, but it's just one of those things I've never read. In the nineties, um, so the story took a huge turn because the story in the eighties was more like almost like an art deco art style. And then when it came to dark horse comics in the nineties, it took a much darker turn and also jumped, I think like 2000 years into the future and was oh, shit, about yeah. a society. Yeah. I remember hearing about also this. Was yeah. Very violent, very violent. Um, but in a very adult cerebral way, like I, Grendel was one of the few books, maybe the only book that I would go to the store. I'd pick it up. I'd come home and I would read it and I would put it down at the end of each issue with almost a headache from (laughs) processing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it was dense, but in a great way. All right. Grendel. Um, Yeah. I got to check this out. Like I'm always looking to fill in, in those holes in my knowledge of things. I just, you know, miss no particular reason. We all have those things that sometimes it takes us decades. I'll tell you to what, catch, I, catch I will put this up to the universe. Hopefully someone will, important will hear this. I'm fucking dying for a Grendel movie because <laughs> Grendel war child was one of the, it was like a 10 issue or 12 issue mini series that, okay. We've had the dark Knight, We've had uh Watchmen, We've had I'm trying to think what other we had crazy Preacher. movie recently. We had, well, is it, Preacher lasted for a four season television series. And I know yeah. a lot of comic book fans of Preacher uh, complained about it. Well, so here's I'm what someone I'm that at. was there at the very beginning and I fucking loved it. Like Grendel can happen. Grendel can happen. Well, that's what I'm saying is the world I think today is ready for it. Back, back in the nineties, there's no way in hell they could have greenlit a Grendel war child movie, but the world's ready for it now. Yeah. I mean, shit, so, we have a C- we have a TV series of the boys. 
So that's yeah, it was my Randall fucking now. mind that that happened yeah. because I read the as I already brought up. I was a fan of Preacher, so obviously a fan of Garth Ennis, and I read mm-hmm. the Boys as it came out issue by issue, and mm-hmm. the very fact that we have a legitimately good television series of it, I, I keep thinking like um, like nine year old to like twenty year old me would have never remotely have believed what media has turned into now. And I mean, in a positive right. way, like yeah, this yeah. is what I was hoping to see. Uh, All right. So, so where, where were we? <laughs> well, I think we were still in teenage years. We were talking about yeah. influences. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, uh, influential preacher. yeah. 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 So you were um, definitely excited by horror by this point. Oh yeah. yeah, it was it was like my thing. Like that was like really in teenage years. Like I love all imaginative forms of art, but it, like it was in my teenage years I really cemented that I was like a ho- like horror was my thing. And like other, other titles than, other than your parents by this point did you find any other friends or family to who had shared an interest in this kind nope, of thing? Nope. Nope. I was always the, like I said, I was always like the guy. Like I had a, I, I had a good social life. I had some very close friends. Like we would get together about once a month and do like, all, we, like I was a guy, like we did myself and my male friends, we did sleepovers, but our sleepovers fucking kicked ass because mm-hmm. we get a stack of movies from the video store and go watch them in like non hard titles that we watched during the time was also like Brazil, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, um, uh, Pulp Fiction, like I, I like all like all this amazing media. We we just stay up all night together uh, watching watching movies. Okay, cool. so you had a social group. It just yes. wasn't horror. Yep, yep, yeah. Did you have anything uh, terrifying happen to you as a teen in real life? Um, the looking back on it. It was not terrifying because it was just a reality that I knew. But my town that I did live in, small town Pennsylvania, is fucking weird. And what I mean by that, it's a uh, sundown town. Do other one of you know what a sundown town is? Yes. No. For anyone listening that does not know what a sundown town is, means when you're not, if you ain't white, you shouldn't be around when the sun goes down. Oh, and yeah, one of those, yeah. The yeah. boss at my very first job I ever had was the open local Grand Dragon and the KKK, yeah. which it's one of those things looking back on, I was like, holy fucking shit, like that was around. And it's like, you know, I never once ascribed to those viewpoints. Like I always, even as a, a young person, I saw that all that bigotry, all that stuff is just bullshit, dumb and full of shit. Um, but it was just the reality around me. But it didn't affect you personally. I mean, I'm a, I'm a white person, so they didn't give a shit about me. And well, um, where I was going with that is just to double check that, you know, something hadn't happened to a friend of yours kind of thing. You know, it doesn't just cause it didn't happen. to you doesn't mean it doesn't affect you. Yeah, no, no, it didn't. Um, I mean, and due to the, like, it's one of those things looking back on it, like, like I'm sure it was because of the nature of that area that, um, I was in, like, I didn't have a, a, uh, uh, a friend that was not white until I left that town and went to college. Right. Mm. What about scary dreams? Any oh. scary dreams on your team? No, no. Okay. Um, did you, we already covered Halloween. Uh, so no, nothing that triggered any, uh, lasting fears in teenage years. Nope. Okay. Adulthood. Yes. Hey. <laughs> so what are some of the scary things that uh, have really impacted you as an adult? Oh man, scary things that really impacted me as an adult. Like you haven't had any time to think about this. Come on. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, You're the one to what does what, what, what exactly like scary things mean? As in like actual like because I feel like when I got into adulthood, like I still have I still find this f- stuff fun and so it it could mean a lot of different things but let's just start with is there anything that has scared you as an adult well i still sometimes get you know scared by some uh like silly movies while i'm watching the movie like i uh thing that immediately pops in my head last movie i saw that i legitimately thought was a fucking terrifying movie terrified on shutter not the movie terrifier or whatever it's called on Netflix, which is about the killer clown, but 
terrified on Shudder. It's a, I believe, an Argentinian film, haunted oh, yeah. house movie, huh? fucking scary ass movie. Holy shit! The first ten minutes of that movie is one of the like scariest openings I've ever seen in the movie. Like it oh, legitimately. Oh, it's just so well done. You know, it's it's really funny because I've mentioned multiple times here that um, I don't believe in ghosts. And in case it's not clear, I am an atheist, but ghost movies get, th- get under my skin. Why? I don't know why. Haunted house movies in particular get under my skin as an adult. And they're the, they're the movies that are most likely to actually give off that real fear response. Hmm. Is it just like the tone of the film, like the the way things are shot, the lighting and cinematography, the the score, and like that pregnant pause before you have what I like to call a, a silent jump scare, not a dun, you know, with the the typical jump scares, but just something that like supernatural or otherworldly crawls by in the background with silence, no noise, and you're just like, holy shit! A quick side note: I'm going to go against the, what's the popular talking point i love jump scares i don't give a shit what anyone says i think jump scares are awesome but i'm, I'm saying i like them if they're done well that that silent jump scare but um what i think it actually more ties back to is actually the whole gremlins thing is it like a really good uh haunted house movie which terrified falls into mm. is reality starts upending without context okay 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 uh like i really like spe- specifically not ghost movies but haunted house movies because the house, the place you live, where you spend all of your time suddenly stops making sense. And that's an idea that really attracts me. And I find in movies that are like movies, good haunted house movies, because there's a lot of shitty haunted house movies. So don't get me wrong. Yeah. Good haunted house movie really fucking nails that. Um, oh shit. Uh, in the past year, his house, was fantastic it's that's that's on netflix if people haven't seen it that movie actually got me a little bit i thought that was phenomenal and legitimately creepy same reasons different reasons uh, i guess same and different reasons his house have either one of you seen his house have not i'm looking at pictures of it on imdb right now it's, it's it about um, interesting it's about refugees from sudan going to britain and they are immigrants um, applying under refugee status. And while their claims are being processed, they're assigned to a apartment to live in. And they have to live in this place and, you know, keep up, you know, good with everything or else, you know, they'll be deported back to Sudan, which is in major upheaval. And they're, they're from an ethnic group that's a target of genocide in Sudan. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, they can't go back to Sudan. And it just so happens to turn out that the apartment they're assigned to is balls to the wall, fucking haunted with ghosts. So mm-hmm. they are. So their choices go back to Sudan and be killed in ethnic genocidal conflicts, or stay in a the most haunted fucking apartment you've ever seen in a movie. It, it's it's so good. It's so good. I cannot recommend it enough. I loved it. Let let me ask you something. We you know we've talked about potential phobias and stuff like that. Um, yeah. How do you feel about loss of control? Mm. Oh, I mean, I I don't really know. I I wouldn't say I'm like really into it. But is anybody into that idea? I don't think so. Let, let me I mean, rephrase that. Certain but fetishes, but is that a certain not a fetish, but like a phobia? Like, do you have a fear of losing control? You know, I think that's what's been like it's been hinted at kind of at times like what what it's not necessarily loss of control, but the randomness of something bigger negatively impacting me without warning, without context, without any um any way of rationalizing with it or internally of something just completely beyond my control. War, I find terrifying. Like the idea of a bomb just being dropped on you. And it's because people more powerful than you that have more money than you getting into a dispute and you're just trying to live your life and then suddenly it's just over. Right. Like, like yeah. that's an idea I find very terrifying. Here's the thing. you The phrase you used, negative impact with no context, but that 
and what we're talking about here about, you know, innocent people being bombed. I mean, that phrase negative impact with no context, it's another way of saying no control. I guess so. But I, I don't really feel like I, I'm in control. I really at any point in my life, I've never really felt like I was in control. It's just kind of like rolling with the punches and trying to do best with the cards you've been dealt. Actually, ooh, ooh, that makes sense. The ADHD. Yeah, I wish yeah. I wish I could be like, but I don't really. Uh, I don't really feel like I've really uh, I've really been at any point in my life that ever experienced that. And that's, that's what I meant by connecting back to the ADHD that I could see how the ADHD could both trigger a love for chaos, but also trigger a potential desire to feel like I wish I had some control, you know, yo, yo, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're hitting some chords here, man. You're speaking my language. Cause yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Touching on something we haven't talked, talked about before, Chris. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying I can definitely relate to this because yeah, I mean, I've never really been diagnosed or uh, looked into um, the effects of Adderall, but um, I, I am fairly certain I have at least some level of ADHD and, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's like, it's, it's almost like, or I don't know, maybe, you, you briefly mentioned it before, Jeff. Um, I think everybody wants a certain level of control. That's that's kind of a natural desire mm -hmm. to want things to be in order, to want things to make sense or to to be right. And the reason I was tying back to ADHD is because if you have that, you've never felt right. That you've had right the the desire for that is is that much stronger, right? Yeah, I I, I guess I guess so. Um, well, I mean, I'm saying that, but part of the, what I'm saying here is I'm also asking you, does that, mm, does that does ring that a bell? Compute? Does that, does, yeah. Does that feel right to you? I mean, it feels and the right. vibe I'm getting is it, it feels doesn't. Right. Wait, wait, no, no, I'm, wait, it, you say it doesn't, I, I'm not, I mean, you're not really, it, it doesn't to your responses don't sound to me like you're going, oh yeah, definitely. That's it. And you're like, eh, you know what no, I mean? No, no, no. I'm trying to be more like, like thoughtful thinking about it. Like. No, I think that is, I don't know. Um, I'm also a very contradictory person at points because like, I both want there to be kind of like, I, I feel like if in my ideal world to be like constant, beautiful, anarchic, artistic mm. chaos, but mm. everyone be safe mm. and secure. I could fucks with that. <laughs> and the safe and secure part is partially control. I mean... I you can't I, be safe and secure in that kind of chaos without having some element of control. I guess so. Yeah. It's, you know, the older you get, like, and I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised. We've also like, especially with some of the previous guests uh, you've had on, we've not, we've only kind of briefly hinted at here and there over my love for extreme, extreme horror. And that's also mm -hmm. like the uh, aspect of horror that I've professionally have worked in the most is extreme horror. And, okay. and that's because that's the stuff that I actually find legitimately upsetting. And yeah. that's why I work in it. It's stuff that deals with things of torture, of rape, of, of bigotry. Uh, that's the things I find absolutely the most upsetting. You know, the haunting, I, I say it's scary, but this other stuff I find upsetting. And... Yeah. It's because, well, there's no such thing as a haunted house. I'm sorry for everyone listening. It doesn't exist. Mm. Um, but every single woman that I've been intimately close to in my life has been, um, like, and when I say intimately, I don't, I don't mean just, I don't mean, like, that I fucked them. I mean, like, people, women that I've had sincere, open, honest relationships with that we've had the intimate interactions has been the victim of some form of sexual harassment, assault all the way up to rape. Um, and I've known people that have been of other colors of mine that have been the victims of uh, hate crimes. I've known, um, you know, I've known people who have died from horrible illnesses and this is the stuff that actually upsets me. And mm. I find that horrifying. And in my actual professional horror life of the work that I have been 
associated with and the work that I have helped birth into the world, I guess, um, mm-hmm. has focused a lot on that type of stuff. And that's why it's because I, cause I find that upsetting. So hang on a second, because yeah. that's, it's kind of interesting because we've taken a turn from, yeah, we took a, I, I, I did a major, <laughs> major pivot right there. <laughs> right. So we've gone from chaos is exciting to this other stuff. That's upsetting. So yes. what's the drive to focus on what's upsetting? It allows some sense of understanding in a safe and controlled way of mm-hmm. that. These things are so awful. It's so unimaginable. And it's some way of safely exploring it. And also in my years of uh, uh, producing it, being involved in projects that have done this, I also view a meta level of, I, I, I think there's actually a big issue in violence in media of it not being graphic enough. Um, I'm going to go back to a, uh, old this is a comic book pool here there's gonna be some old school comic book fans here that are gonna love what i'm about to say of oh, steve shit. gerber from howard the duck um <clears throat> yes yes okay. don't ignore the howard the duck movie the howard the duck movie does not exist as far as i'm concerned <laughs> because the comic book is a brilliant piece of social satire and mm. there is an issue there is an issue storyline where howard runs for president and one of his campaigns one of his uh, campaign um, issues is about violence in the media and that there needs to be more of it. And it's why does there need to be, and it needs to be more graphic. And it's a, why do we need more graphic violence in media? And it's because that way, when somebody gets it in their head that they're angry and they're going to take a gun or a knife to another human being, they know exactly what that suffering and what that horror looks like. You get shot it hurts. You suffer. You you are taken out of the game, even if you survive. Survive. No, no, no. It's cool. You just you take a, a giant, a, a big buck knife, and you put it on a stove burner, and then you like you cauterize your shoulder. Yeah, exactly. And All good. that fucking bullshit, which is fun. <laughs> it's like don't get me wrong. Like it's super fun. I love lots of things that do that. However, I think there's a lot of real value in showing the responsibility of violence and there's not it's not popular to be responsible about violence it's not respon- it's not popular to be responsible about the ramifications of hate and abuse and i liked being a part of um of creators and work putting out there that is actually responsible about it unfortunately a lot of other people find that exploitive or upsetting and to be quite frank i think they're wrong i think they are missing the point would you say that um more accurate and graphic violence in in movies or uh series is it's like european cigarettes they have images on every pack that shows (laughs) the inside of the lungs and what it's doing to your body so maybe like more graphic and more realistic uh violence in shows and, and movies would be kind of a public service in that way. Like I do very much think so. Do you so. feel that you have uh, an emotional attachment to responsibility? Uh, yes, I, I feel I do. I'm, I'm not really quite sure why, but I feel I do. I feel like if I am producing this work, help getting it out there in the world, also creating it myself, I feel I do have responsibilities as a creator. I don't just mean about responsibilities about your, what you're producing as a creator. I mean, the concept of responsibility period. Do you, do you feel that you have some specific emotional connection to that about, you know, respecting it or teaching other people about it? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I, I feel, I feel that it's a human being. Um, and that's even just beyond being involved uh, my entire adult life in the arts. And though also, like I, I, I referenced earlier, that um, I, you know, I actually worked in politics for a period of time. Like I, I feel, like I feel, all of us as humans should be responsible for trying to bring about the best, most peaceful world we can. And we're failing terribly. And we're failing terribly at it. <laughs> Yes. How utopian. 
Has there been something that maybe happened in your life that impacted you in a way that, um, Ooh, wait a minute. I kind of just almost said it to myself. Um, <laughs> Oh, really? Now we're getting to you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the question anyway, and then I'll, then I'll talk more about what I was just thinking. Um, has anything happened in your life that has, uh, like in reality impressed on you, the importance of educating people about responsibility? It's nothing's ever happened directly to me, but I hear and see what has happened to other people. And I really, really take it to heart. So what I was thinking a moment ago, when I stopped myself, I remembered what you said about the two transformers fighting and falling on the highway. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. This brings it all back around. It, it ties into the same thing of what you do affects other people. Yes. And you know, you're, it seems like you have a, f- a fear or a phobia somewhere deep about that. Like you say, it may not have been happened to you personally, but it's affected people you care about and seems to be something that's important to you that, you know, you want to educate other people about their responsibility, that the things that they do affect other people. Yes, very much, very much. Um, like I, I, um, I was the head editor of Dead Eye Press for 10 years. And during that time, I published um, some of the most vile, disgusting, like people would ask me, like, why do you, why do you support work that's so, so graphic in this depictions of violence? And it's like, because I want you to know what it looks like. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, as you were saying that, I was kind of, wondering to myself, how do I compare contrast this with the love of chaos that you referred to in your childhood? And I I'm thinking to myself, instead of saying the phrase love, hate relationship, maybe love fear relationship with chaos. Does that make sense? It it does. It does. But, but as I say, like, I like, <laughs> I know it sounds like a contradiction in terms, but like a safe chaos, I guess it's, I like being surprised, but I don't like being surprised if it's going to lead to a real world negative result. I'm wondering, you know, to maybe, you know, bring it all, all back to childhood, but I'm wondering, you know, if, if you had this personality, the, the love of chaos, I could, and and it seemed like your parents were right, reasonable uh, people. I could also see them sitting you down and saying, it's great that you love that, but you also have to be responsible. Oh yes. Oh, oh my God. That's so interesting. You should say that. You know what? I actually had. Um, approaching puberty, which I have literally never heard anyone else have. My father had a consent rape talk with me. Huh. We're talking about the 90s. Huh. Because um, I first, and this was when in my uh, early teen years, I first started getting, um, like, you know, showing an interest for art and entertainment that featured, you know, like um, um, sexual violence in it. And my father, this is before, for the record, before he became a safe Christian, saw that in me, and we actually had a talk. And this is no joke. We went out for fucking pizza. This is not, <laughs> we did not a joke at all. And he's like, hey, Jeff, you're like, I, I know I've seen you, been, like, you seem to like these movies, and I see you're liking these books. And essentially it was a talk of like, like, uh, about like sexual violence. And it's like, it's perfectly fine if you enjoy it in a fantasy medium because it's not real, but with actual another person. And at this point I was a virgin. Like I had not, I had not had sex yet. I had not even had anything close to sex. I hadn't even had my first kiss yet. So I was, I was like totally removed from any of this, but, um, and it's like, but like, you know, like, all right, you're getting interested in that stuff and that's fine, but you have to understand that it's only fine in, in the fa- in the context of fantasy and consent. And like, I had a like rape talk, consent talk. And I was probably around like, I want to say around 13. It was, and mm-hmm. um, of my like age group, like I'm, I'm, I'm about to be, uh, um, I'm about to be 37, and I literally have never met uh, another guy around my age that ever had their their dad sit them down at that age and have like 
a rape consent talk. It's kind of funny because I didn't, my father never did. Um, but remember I mentioned the cousin whose comic books were left at the house. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually, a, it was actually a female cousin <laughs> and she, it wasn't a sit down talk. She wrote me a letter. Um, mm. I, it was, I had spent one semester of college uh, on campus, uh, failed out miserably. It was, didn't, didn't work out, but, but what had happened, it was, what had happened was there it is. when you were a freshman, you had to live on campus. The building was co-ed, but the rooms obviously were not. Um, there was one weekend, you know, Friday or Saturday night that I ended up hanging out in some room of the, the rooms. It was three bedrooms to a room, two beds in each room. So six, six to a room base or six apartment, whatever. And I wound up spending the night with some girl in her bed. Didn't have sex, but making out. And I went to go see her the following day and her roommates wouldn't let me in the room and told me that she didn't want to talk to me, which I was very confused about. Mm. And I remember mentioning this to my cousin and she basically, you know, wrote me the letter saying, you know, a lot of girls won't tell you no because they're just confused or, or haven't been taught to and, and don't know what to do or say, or, or so they just go along. Um, and it, it was a very scary uh, moment for me to sit down and realize that had I wanted to go further, that maybe she wouldn't have stopped me. And I could have found myself in a very bad space there where not only would I have been guilty of potentially doing something, but it would have been shitty for me because she would, if she didn't stop me, how was I supposed to know? Um, which is scary, yeah. but also as somebody who is very respectful of consent and, and the women in my life, I also felt horrible because for her, like God, what, what, what kind of life must she have led to be in that position to where she is now? And I hope she, you know, learns what she needs to learn. Uh, and and that's what that's what amazes me is that like uh, people push back over the I, at the idea of um, teaching men not essentially not to rape, not to not to be sexual abusers of like i had that my my dad had that conversation with me when i was very young and almost no other man has that experience that i've talked to and that should be like we we have this thing in our culture of the birds and the bees conversation we also need to have the consent conversation, conversation. Which should, should be Probably part of the birds hurt. and bees conversation yeah, if, if, if be, they were but one this is insanely not and that's like mind boggling. I, I, I yeah. had that and I see what happened with my, with my parents is they saw of like, Oh, we fucking brought this on ourselves. Like we introduced him to this fucked up shit early <laughs> and he's going all into it. We brought right. this on ourselves. We got to fucking like control this and tying back to early of like being like when I was young, of like, like 10 years old, like, Oh, can I see a clockwork orange? No. <laughs> and, and like it, it makes sense in this context here of like you don't need to be watching rape stuff when you're that age let's wait till you're 14 and 15 then we'll show it to you which is what happened but i also already had the consent uh consent rape conversation hmm. yeah you know we actually have a couple more questions here but oh, I love I, i'm almost feeling like like they're not really needed to come up with a pretty good summary. I think we go through them anyway, but if I were to wrap up the call right now, I would say, you know, we've already pretty much, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, controlled chaos and responsibility seem to be some very key elements for you. Shall we say in my ideal world, every, but every person is responsible. And <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. We, and we don't realize the problem <laughs> and we don't live in that world. It's why I love Star Trek. Like it's, if I, um, Star Very Trek is, is normally what I like to describe my political beliefs as, because if I say anarchists, I, uh, in, in, I have this, a, this, I, I this could get, turn into a completely different podcast. And I don't mean to, and I don't mean to stop you for a second. Cause yeah. Star Trek is not that ideal world either. I would, no, I, if you're going to say anything, they might have better 
ways of dealing with uh, I am I am also a huge fan of Deep Space Nine. I know it's not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean they they have healthier ways of dealing with the realities of the fact that people aren't like that. Uh personally responsible, I mean. But I just want to say uh Avery Books is batshit insane. <laughs> I recognize that name. Remind me who that is. <laughs> he played Cisco on D- on DS9. I went to the oh, same okay. college as him. No shit. No shit. He went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Nice. Okay. But uh, going going back to what the point I was making is like responsibility and constantly trying to do better and be better. And mm. that sounds... For some people, that sometimes sounds strange to somebody who has dedicated their entire life um, to the, like, professionally and personally to the horror genre. And it's like, to me, it's all interrelated. Mm -hmm. No, I I can see that. That was kind of why I, you know, said that, that, you know, the the controlled chaos, but also responsibility. That, yep. And as you say, you know, sometimes in order to teach somebody that, you know, something is bad, you got to show them what's bad. Exactly. And uh, like, there's like, like, mm, I have like some really complicated thoughts on that as well. (laughs) So let's run through some of the other questions here before we uh, can go too far off into left field again. Um, (laughs) I'm guessing at this point, you now have friends and family, if not family, at least friends that, uh, share your interest in horror? Oh, totally, totally. Um, like I have so many close friends that um, are just into all the extreme fucked up shit that I am into. I am very fortunate and blessed that I have a romantic partner that also appreciates all this fucked up shit. Mm-hmm. So, yes, yes. Um, where I did not have it before, I totally have a social network now that loves or at the very least appreciates all the same things that I do. Right. Exactly where I was going with that. The social benefits of, you know, having supportive people around you. Yeah. It's um, wonderful. Indeed. No, uh, no new fears triggered in your adult years that you haven't had before. Oh shit. Fuck. Oh, that's a big, qu- that's a big one. Um, <laughs> fears uh, of uh, viral outbreaks of some kind, maybe so, in the recent, uh, Oh, times. no, no. Since I got into my uh, 30s, I began to have uh, depression issues and yep. um, also like, uh, I, I, fuck it. Just be honest. I don't really care. Um, I, I, I'm OK with being honest of like uh, at times like suicidal inclination thoughts. You know, it going to sound strange to say this, but. It's not that having suicidal thoughts are necessarily unhealthy. It's quantity, quantity and quality. I guess we could say it's Um, a quantity is the issue with me. It's very intrusive. That's where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. It's very intrusive. That's the word exactly. I was going to very, very constant. And that's where it gets frustrating. That was the word I was going to use was intrusive because that was the word that my counselor used with me when I talked with her about, you know, similar things that I was particularly in my late twenties, early thirties, also dealing with some depression and things like that. And I would have these thoughts pop into my head and that was the word she used was intrusive, intrusive thoughts. And, yeah. you know, question me on, like I say, the severity and the frequency, because it's not necessarily the, the fact of just having them. It's like I say, the severity and the quant- the quant- quantity and quality that is the issue. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, also, I just want to make it very clear to anyone listening: don't worry about me. I'm okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just something I have to, you know, wrestle with. Like, we all have our challenges, well, and apparently, as I'm getting older, this is one of my challenges. Well, it's not just something to be wrestled with alone either. There are resources out there to, to yes. help people with that. Um, which and, then, I, and I encourage anyone that's hearing this that may some like that may. Like having suicidal thoughts and having them very frequently as sometimes happens to me. Uh, don't keep that to yourself. Talk to other people. Yeah. It's okay to be open about it. And like, I don't mean talking publicly in a platform like I'm doing right now, but it's okay to talk to others about it. Like trust those who are trustworthy. Yeah. 
don't d- don't let that shit you know wear you down. Yeah. Um. So quickly on that note, it sounds like you <laughs> have uh you have someone to talk to about that. Um. I very privately have talked to many people about it, and I am like I've already mentioned at this point in my life, I have a wonderful support network. So I've got great loved ones. I've got great friends that have been very. Uh, supportive with me through many difficulties I faced, including this. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I should have clarified. Good. We could have cut that, uh, or or you know, not made that part part of the interview. But oh no, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Yes, yes. Okay, fine. Totally. Um, all this can be public. I, I'm assuming all this will be public. <laughs> okay. Um, so these next next two questions yeah. uh, are not just horror themed. Yeah. Uh, any any genre and life overall. Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> Those are two questions. Uh, what are what's your favorite movie and what movie have you seen more times than any other? Okay, okay. Um, see, this is one I was really thinking of listening to previous episodes. The mm. movie that I've seen the most time ever. I cannot figure out because there's a shit ton of movies that I have seen uh, more times I could count. But I can tell you the movie that I've seen the most in the theaters, which is still seen in the theaters until the movie theaters fucking shut down, was Mm -hmm. Jurassic Park. I was nine years old when I went to see Jurassic Park opening day. My dad took me and blew my fucking little kid mind. And Portland, Oregon has a wonderful movie theater scene. Every summer, at least one theater is doing Jurassic Park. And I've <laughs> every summer now of like the past 11 years, I've seen Jurassic Park on the big screen. And a couple of years ago, they did that 3D re-release of Jurassic Park where they converted to 3D. I went to go see that, and it was awesome. <laughs> Holy shit! The T Rex attack in 3D was amazing. It was it was so cool. Um, it's like so- you're sitting on the toilet. <laughs> no, but it really is. But it is. It really is like you're sitting on the toilet when he does that bite scene. It's like, <laughs> but so um, I really have no idea the movie I've seen the most because I can name like dozens of movies I've watched obsessively. I'm sometimes one of those people. Um, okay. And the one that your favorite movie? Oh, my favorite movie. Oh, okay. Um, I can't name one movie, but I can give a definitive, my personal three favorites. I cannot decide amongst okay. them. My three favorite movies are Clive Barker's Hellraiser, David Cronenberg's Videodrome. Also nice. And yeah. Alexandro Holorowski's The Holy Mountain. Ooh, the whole, oh, I think I've heard of that one. one yeah, it's on my list. It was literally funded by the Beatles is the ultimate example in surrealist filmmaking. Hmm. Okay. So, I mean, the, the main purpose for those two questions are to see if, uh, you know, if they underscore the things that we've already talked about or to highlight new things, Hmm. if we haven't talked about them, uh, I think in all three of all four of these movies kind of underscore. That's what I was going to say. It feels like it underscores a lot of what we're saying about that whole idea of like, chaos and understanding mm-hmm. yep yeah. mm-hmm. um so do you see any common threads about what kinds of horror you like in terms of you know there's cannibalism occult metaphysical body horror oh man i um like you're asking me like what's my if you ask me what's my specific favorite horror subgenres, i like body horror gore flicks and haunted house movies right okay Right. Like those are my various favorites. And again, the same thing. The the question is designed to to see if it underscores or highlights something different. And I feel it. Yeah, I feel like it just again. underscores <laughs> everything we've been talking about over this time. Mm-hmm. Which is per- perfectly fine. Uh, Makes sense. Wrong with that. Uh, last one of the last questions is any idea why you like those things? We already kind of went over that, so mm-hmm. don't really need to ask, answer I believe that one. So. Um, so the last question is why horror? Because, for example, controlled chaos or uncontrolled and, you know, teaching your responsibility and lessons aren't those things that could be taught through other genres and other means. 
Oh, I feel they can be, but to be totally frank and honest with you, I feel those other genres do it really shitty if they even try to at all. And, like, um, like one of the things I fucking hate, like, this is why I don't like fantasy, but, like, a lot of fantasy just does not address the ramifications. And there's a lot of, uh, in, like, I don't really like a lot of the fantasy genre, and also a lot of the Western genre. I fucking hate Westerns. Because of the <laughs> idea of, like, the noble hero good guy comes in and clears out all the bad guys. I'm like, that's fucking boring, and also has nothing to offer us to our real world experience because I feel the most successful art, the most worthwhile art, even as it may be so removed from our everyday experiences, still has something to offer us insight about what we go through on a day to day basis. And I feel that horror is kind of the genre that offers the most to it because we're all going through our own shit. And we've all suffered our own shit and really bad shit's going to happen. And we have to be responsible in how we address and deal with them and how we can mentally come to terms with the awfulness of, quite frankly, our reality. Mm -hmm. I'm just hoping we don't have World War III as like one, of the, one of the next things that we have to deal with the horror movies yeah. are preparing, preparing us for. Yeah, let, let's not. I <laughs> sincerely hope no, so. No. It sounds like uh, so. There's the two things. There's the emotional part, and then mm -hmm. there's the um, the responsibility part, which are, are the two big things mm -hmm. for you. You said that you don't feel that these other genres really approach their responsibility as well as they could or should, if at yes. all. I would probably say I disagree with that. I think that might just be your interpretation. I'm happy with but that. I can see <laughs> that, but I can see how these other genres may not trigger the emotional response for you that that horror yes does. so i could still see how that makes sense that for you it's still horror because it it does touch on both those and things. If, if someone that's a bigger science fiction and horror fan than i am or a bigger fantasy than horror fan i am that has those types of reactions i 100 percent understand i am just talking mm -hmm. from my own perspective so yeah. uh before we cap the call you uh you want to pitch anything uh that you're working on uh no i i just want to end this at the time period we are at um anyone listening to this thank you so much uh please wear a mask please get your vaccinations when you're able to um and please if you have spare money to throw around and you're looking to throw it someplace Please so it's uh, your local bail fund communities, eight local ACLUs. The world has been a terrible place for the past several years. I love extreme horror. I love horror, but I only like it in fantasy. I don't like it in the real world. I love that we gave you a spot to pitch something and you pitch responsibility. Right? Yes. <laughs> it's very noble of you. Yes, that too. Well, thank you for being our guest. Thank you uh, so much And thank much you for to anybody me. out there listening. Our pleasure. Uh, for anybody out there listening, please do come visit us at horrormakesushappy.com. We have a list of people we'd like to interview. Uh, if you can connect us with any of them, or if you know somebody you'd like to have added to the list, let us know. Hit us up on social media. Um, just let us know how we're doing. <laughs>